Well, hello everyone. Um, it's Carol Scott with the Resource Center. Today is Tuesday, October the 20th, 2020. And we are meeting with the new state ombudsman and some mentors. Um, we just spent uh, the last uh, few minutes introducing ourselves and getting to know each other, um, which obviously is a key part of being a new state ombudsman is to know that you're not, um, that you're not alone. We're gonna talk today about um, ethics and um, I am gonna share my screen. Maybe, there we go. So, um, The, the purpose of today's discussion um, and the goal is to provide an overview. Oops, where'd you guys go? Is to um, provide an overview of ethics specifically related to the advocacy and program management of the long-term care ombudsman program. We'll be reviewing the basics of ethics and the ombudsman program um, and then discuss some ethical considerations for advocacy and program management. So what is ethics? Ethics is defined as a set of moral principles, a theory or system of moral values, the principles of conduct governing an individual or a group or a guiding philosophy. And that's straight out of Merriam-Webster online dictionary. Like many other professions, ombudsmen have a code of ethics that provides the guiding philosophy and principles for their work. Long-term care ombudsman responsibilities go from individual advocacy to systems change. Ombudsmen are always, uh, must always exemplify ethical behavior and decision-making and achieving resident goals in the most ethical way possible is essential to the success of ombudsman and the credibility of the program. So we have a polling question. Oops, can you guys, um, wow, shoot, what's going on here? I'm back, let's try that again. Share screen, share there, share there. So can you guys see that? The stack of papers? Yeah, okay. So the first polling question, and you can just ch uh, chat in. Um, do you have a professional code of ethics associated, or actually you don't have to chat in, there's so few of us, feel free to unmute. Um, do you have a, a professional code of ethics associated with a degree or credential other than the ombudsman code of ethics? So this might be social workers, uh, nurses. Yep. Yes. What what kind? Social work. Social work. Yep. Okay. So um and and Stephanie's saying yes too. So um the, it gets kind of confusing if there are two different, you know, if you have two different codes that you're trying to follow, you know, um the the probably the hardest one um, when people come into the program is things like um, not being mandated reporters. And so it's a, it's a um, very important part of the program to not share information um, unless we've been given permission by the, the resident to share their name. And that, that actually becomes a moral dilemma for some people. And we've had um, when, it, when this became very clear nationally with the rule um, a couple of years ago, we actually had some staff and volunteers that left the program um, because they felt like their, um, say their, um, their as a nurse or a other professional, they felt like they needed to give that information out. So, um, but it's a, it's a core part of being an ombudsman to protect the identity of residents without their permission. So um, the code of ethics, um, 
you know, we live in a very gray area. Um, the, uh, we, we work with individuals with cognitive impairments. We encounter situations where there are conflicting views or there are questions about the circumstances of the case. Residents may have some cognitive impairments, be frail, conditions that change quickly. Ombudsman encounters situations where the resident's wants may seem unwise or offensive to the ombudsman. Also, you'll work, you know, you work with communities of residents, individuals of various personalities, needs, and wants. Um, right or wrong act actions, you may have several different people insisting that you take a certain course of action on behalf of a resident. You might have the staff, the family, and the resident's perspective may change during your conversations regarding what can be done. Achieving consistency in ombudsman approaches, especially when wading through the gray area is important. Again, assisting, achieving consistency in ombudsman approaches, especially when wading through the gray areas is important. And it comes down to the code of ethics guiding the actions. Dilemmas sometimes arise regarding how to apply ethical principles to a specific situation. Um, oh, second question, um, is training on the code of ethics for ombudsman part of your initial or ongoing training for your representatives? Yes. 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 Definitely. Excellent. And I figured the answer would be yes. So um, ombudsmen have to be grounded in good ombudsman practice and also in ethical ways of working. The ombudsman rule complaint processing in 1324.19 is helpful. It covers resident direction and sharing identifying information with other entities. Jackie Glover um, was a presenter, um, gosh, 19 years ago, and she echoes um, the ombudsman principles, the how the approach is important, not just the results. So good ethics, good facts, ombudsman investigation take time to gain perspective and um, really point to having done your homework. The range of accept acceptable actions, often there is more than one potential resolution or action step back from feeling like all the responsibility for doing the correct thing is yours alone. Other individuals have a role and may have more of a voice and authority to establish direction than you do. Pause to seek input from others, whether the issue relates to statewide program management and policies or individual or systems advocacy. Ah. Sorry. Um, so which of these would you want applied if you were the individual facing a tough decision? As advocate ombudsman, we seek to assure that informed consent by the resident based on the ethical principle of autonomy is utilized to the greatest extent possible. So informed consent and autonomy. When the principle of informed consent is not applicable, long-term care ombudsmen advocate for the use of substituted judgment as a decision-making principle. And I think that, you know, obviously would come in if the resident isn't able to communicate what they would want. Um, and there may be situations where best interest may be appropriate or the only recourse. Other cases may call for a combination of substitute judgment and best interest with neither being applied to the exclusion of the other. Ombudsman must consider a resident's decision-making capacity and ways to reinforce the resident's autonomy when choosing which decision-making principle would be applicable to a case. 
Does your program teach these principles and apply them in case scenarios so that ombudsman representatives understand how to work each of these? I would hope so. How do you help ombudsman representatives understand that their role is to create the conversation to engage others in decision making on behalf of the resident when necessary? Let me let me say that again and if you guys want to comment. How do you help ombudsman representatives understand that their role is to create the conversation to engage others in decision making on behalf of a resident when necessary? This is Amanda. Sometimes family are really, um, they're, they're afraid to make decisions for okay. their loved ones when the loved one's not able to. Um, sometimes they're afraid that they will be held liable for those decisions. And we just need to let them know how important it is to be able to have a decision maker, um, especially on things that need to be addressed right now. Uh, it doesn't give us time to get a guardian. It doesn't get a, give us time to put things in place or the facility to. They need those answers sometime right then. And um, it, I think it's just important that we let them know that how, how important they are and, and that their decisions, um, that, that there's not the liability if they're acting in good faith for their loved one. Absolutely. You know, this is where um, I think, you know, the key is to be able to um, control your own thoughts <laughs> as an ombudsman and to be asking questions and really being turning on the listening skills. Um, I, you know, one of the tough situations that was mentioned last week in the conference was an ombudsman who actually helped write the, um, the care plan, which obviously goes way beyond um, the role of the ombudsman. But even, the, even if an ombudsman makes a suggestion about how to handle somebody or you know how to resolve an issue um, that may be going too far. So you know ombudsmen um, need to be real careful that they are allowing other people to be doing their job and that um, that we try to to stay in the informed consent and autonomy world um, as much as possible and only when the resident um, can't speak for themselves, would we want to use the substituted judgment or the best interest um, and push for, the, for people to be having those conversations? I, I would just say that um, at times the problem is, is the opposite. Um, I guess maybe here in Massachusetts, we have some pushy, pushy families, <laughs> but um, oftentimes we find ourselves trying to facilitate the family making the decision to really consider what the resident would want as opposed to what they themselves might want. Oftentimes those things don't match and it can be a real struggle um, for family members to, to understand that. Carol, that, that's um, hitting a home run there. And you know, this is where um, it would be so good if during um, either training or for um, uh, just uh, whenever you guys get together to talk about issues or cases or whatever, is to maybe try to do a role play. And you know, you can do role plays even if you're not sitting next to each other, um, but it might be interesting to um, have a family member, someone poses a family member trying to, you know, get their way and having the ombudsman, um, uh, you know, try to gently get them to focus not on what they would want, but what their loved one would want. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes practicing those situations are very helpful to staff and volunteers 
um, because you know they're going to come across them. And I think if they've practiced them, they they might feel better in walking away feeling like they've done their best for the resident um, as opposed to you know not having practiced it before. So so thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so substituted judgment is uh, you know you get having factual information about the person. Um, it's it's you have to kind of know the person um, or someone has to to be able to substitute what they think the resident would want. So um, to really to really key in on who are the right people. And I don't know, um, not sure how, uh, you know, right now this is real hard because it's not like the ombudsman. Um, so see you, Lisa. Um, I'm not sure how uh, well <laughs> we can do right now with uh, you know, bringing the right people together um, to hear each other. But I think we have to push for that um, because if we leave somebody important out of the conversation, then uh, we may not be doing the resident um, um, the full justice of, of, the, of what they need to, you know, to have a, uh, the best possible quality of life and care. Um, Questions and issues usually do not arise unless someone makes a decision that is contrary to this decision that professionals or family members think is correct. Um, you know, um, this is, uh, you know, if, if everything's smooth and, and everybody's in agreement, then, then nobody's calling and complaining. But if the resident is, uh, you know, going outside without wearing a jacket or if the resident wants to walk to the, you know, fence and back, um, and, or if they want to um, eat uh, sweets when they're not supposed to, that seems to be when, when we get, uh, when the ombudsman program gets called in. Um, so the values, um, so, well, so don't use autonomy as a club or as a way to divide the resident from individuals who are significant and whom the resident wants included in the decision-making process. Values emerge from relationships and they may change over time. Um, again, these are some of Joan Gibson's words of wisdom. <clears throat> Ombudsman action, um, as you can see here, in, to identify individuals to be involved in the conversation with the resident when conflicts arise, to be able to tolerate ambiguity. Um, and the key to, is the process used to sort out the options and arrive at a choice. Um, you know, we kind of say that we don't do a lot of mediation, but actually anytime we're in a conversation with two people, um, even though we are on the side of the resident, um, we may also be doing some of that mediation of, you know, making sure that the family is stopping and listening um, and maybe even making sure that the resident is stopping and listening so that they can understand where their family is coming from or where the professionals at the nursing home um, are coming from. So polling question number three, is there program guidance to promote consistent approaches in the gray areas among all ombudsman representatives. In other words, do you um, show, show some cases uh, and some situations where there might be competing values? Um, do you talk about those or do you have a policy or procedure happen when there's uh, maybe controversy about what um, it, what needs to be done to uh, reach the resident's um, satisfactory feeling? Well, our, our goal as ombudsman is to um, resolve complaints to the satisfaction of the resident. 
sometimes that can be a, a conflict in itself when the complainant is a family member and and they're really enraged about something, but the resident doesn't see it as an issue. So that's yeah. where that's where you know giving the <laughs> giving that representative um, a pat on the back or to you know again help them understand they may tick off the family member. I mean that may just be that's just kind of the nature of the of the beast is that um, our focus is on the resident and um, if someone is not whatever they're wanting is is not what the resident wants um, yeah we're, we're standing there and I again I think that having some um, role playing or just conversation you know, what would you do in, in, and you have a situation and, and ask people to respond to what would you do? And then, you know, does every, you know, you don't want to embarrass anybody if they say something that's not right. Um, but I think a good conversation amongst your people um, will, will actually help a lot. Um, I think often too, um, taking the time when our uh, local ombudsmen have concerns that, that they just aren't sure about, just taking the time to let them talk and clarify um, what, you know, what our responsibility is and who we work for. That is, that's the way I like to think of it, is we work for the, the residents. That is who trying to um, to serve and just taking the time to um, reaffirm that with uh, with our local ombudsman A absolutely and as um, Jill just typed into the chat um, she's uh, reached out to the University of Delaware to do some mediation training I did the same thing I went to the University of Missouri and um, they actually did uh, a week, we did a, we, in the old days, uh, many, I mean, like in the 90s and the early 2000s, we would have a week long training uh, with my staff, the paid staff, and we brought in the mediator to do a three day training. And it really was very good for us to learn um, some of the tricks of, about mediation, because it, you know, it's all about communication. And if you can pick out some, some parts that, that help you do the, a better job, then, um, then that's very good. So I'm glad, I'm glad you're doing that, Jill. Um, so some questions to ask, um, what harm are we preventing? What good are we doing? What's the real issue? What do we need to know to assist in having a decision made? And what are the residents' questions or concerns? Um, I think those are maybe some basic things that we probably ought to remind ourselves and our representatives um, as they're looking at a case um, or as they're thinking about how they might go about resolving it. And, and as they're maybe swinging back to the resident um, to say, here's, here's kind of how I'm thinking that, that the resolution might go, or here's who I'm thinking about talking with. Um, these are good, these are some good questions that each person ought to be asking themselves. Um, and especially that last one to make sure that we aren't doing anything that the resident wouldn't want us to do. Um, and of course, in teaching ethics, um, the essential, uh, it's essential to help ombudsmen be, be grounded in ethical principles, to be sensitive to ethical issues, to be able to identify internal questions or alerts, and to be supported in asking questions and thinking through the implications before taking action. And boy, that is so hard. Um, you know, it's so easy to you get a complaint and you go, okay, I'll be back, I'll fix this for you, as opposed to maybe going 
to a corner <laughs> thinking through, here's who I need to talk to, here's the questions I need to ask, and then going back to the resident and say, I've thought about this, and here's a way I think that it can be resolved. You know, will you come with me? Will you, is it okay if I bring that person back to the room here? I mean, you know, to me, part of the code of ethics is always involving the resident as much as possible. I mean, the hopes that we would be empowering them to handle their own issues in the future. So um, having <clears throat> training on an ongoing basis about the um, about ethics and applying ethical concepts, I think is, uh, is very important. So the first scenario is um, an ombudsman pro program representative contacts you for consultation. He, um, the resident lives in a uh, nursing home, has a mental health diagnosis and has become very aggressive. Um, his daughter called and asked the ombudsman representative to intervene. She said other residents and some staff are demanding that her dad be removed from the facility. The ombudsman representative is seeking guidance on how to proceed before making a visit. Who has an idea of how you might respond to this person? Well, I'm not sure what the resident would like here. So I think the resident's voice would be important. Okay. Absolutely. So some questions. Um, so what are the ethical and value considerations here? Well, whose agenda are we pursuing? Yeah. You know, we might want to even ask what's the fallout if someone is hurt or um, you know, if they're hurt, if we've advocated for him to remain in the facility, that, I mean, that's got to go through people's, you know, through people's minds. You know, if I advocate for him to stay here after I know that he or, or been told he's been violent, um, what does that say about the person, uh, the ombudsman representative, what does that say about the credibility of the program? And I think this is where it's so important that the ombudsman should not be making, oh, sorry, should not be making, um, <laughs> the ombudsman program should not be making decisions. Right. Um, they should only be raising questions, you know, what you know, what have you, you know, what have you done to stop these? What, what's, what's brought them on? Um, Joe, do you or Heather have any thoughts on this case? Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's always important to, you know, to start with the resident, to talk to the resident. What does the resident want? What's, what's precipitating this right now? Um, You know, I feel like I would need need to really engage with the resident to better understand what what are the resident's issues and why is the resident being accused of this kind of behavior? Um, what's what's triggering the resident and what what can what what can the facility do to help stop the the the, the triggering? I think yeah, it, this is. Go ahead, go ahead, Heather. No, you go ahead, finish, Joe. I, I was just going to say, no, I was just going to say, you know, it, 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 it really, you know, means you need to take the time to engage with the resident and understand what's going on from the resident's perspective. Mm -hmm. Right, you need some context here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is Heather, and so many times the facilities do do not take the time to really find out what Joe said, you know, what is triggering all of that? And you'd wanna see what kind of care plan does this individual have to help support his or her needs and, and really help uh, have a better understanding and background of this situation. Uh, Cause I think sometimes it's so, you know,
As we all know, there some homes are so quick to dish this poor individual. I so Heather, you're kind of going in and out uh, uh, with your audio, but I think the fact that they that there's a mental health diagnosis would say, you know, it, I mean, there'd be a ton of questions. Has his medications changed? Do they need to change? Um, and I would be pushing for all this to be done in the home rather than having him taken out for an evaluation. Um, you know, it would probably uh, depend on how long he's been there. And if this is the first time this has happened um, and he's been there for a couple of years, then um, th the home should be able to, to look back and say what triggered this or, you know, or is it, or is there a need for um, a pharmacist um, and a physician to come in and, and look at the meds he's taking? Okay, so second scenario is you've been asked to join a new statewide elder abuse coalition. You know, the ombudsman program representatives encounter numerous systemic issues related to abuse. You expect your participation will create more awareness of abuse in facilities, help coordinate efforts with other statewide entities, and clarify the role of the Ombudsman Program. One of the coalition's goals is to improve interagency coordination through case review. The other members will expect you to share cases in order to identify individual and systems issues related um, to abuse. So in this case, what are the ethical considerations regarding your participation or what information can you share without resident consent to reveal their identity? Any safeguards you can use? Obviously, we, we can't disclose resident information or identifying information without without appropriate consent. But I think, you know, we can talk about cases without identifying information. I mean, there, there are safeguards we can we can use to um, de-identify resident identities and um, you know, talk about the, the, the real issues that are going on in the with, with this particular resident in, in the facility. Um, Are you still talking or did you stop? I, I stopped. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know, if we, didn't know if you dropped off. You know, I think there's a temptation to want to share too much um, in order to advance systems advocacy and improve coordination. So I think you're absolutely right. We have to really think about this. I, I wonder, is there any difference between being on a statewide coalition and one of your local folks being on, on one on a local level? And would, would it matter if it was a very rural area where there may only be one facility? Yes, of course. Yeah. I think that would make absolutely. It, it would matter if it's a rural area, um, because as we all know so well, um, those identifying uh, situations, whether generalized or not, um, it, folks can identify right off the bat. So smaller uh, mm -hmm. rural areas, we have that happening all the time. People already know. Yeah. And I think, again, that's just, you know, we need to make sure that everybody is just thinking through these things, that they're, that they are really paying attention to, am, am, is, am I really, do I need to give, you know, what information do I really need to give to engage other people to show that there's a problem, to um, identify a systemic issue, or am I just, you know, am I, giving too much information and they're going to be able to figure out who it is. Um, so, you know, I mean, there's a way to tell a story um, to show a point um, 
but but maybe in some situations there's not and 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 you just have to swallow it and say wish i could wish i could uh contribute to this but the the pool of <laughs> of candidates is so small that if i tell you the story you're gonna you're gonna figure out who it is and i and i can't i can't do that be, for the safety of the of the resident and and for their privacy so so one of the um There is um, in the uh, Ombudsman Program Support uh, Program Management, there is an entire ses section on ethics that I hope that you'll um, take a look at. There's a quick reference guide, of uh, ethical guide. There's in-service training, um, conflict of interest, um, and and there's also the NASOP and NALPCO codes of, of ethics. So um, I just encourage you guys to take a few minutes, um, look at some of these resources and um, uh, look at your training and make sure that um, uh, the, some of these situations you might be able to pull in or some of these resources you might be able to pull into your, to your training. Um, any, other thoughts or questions about ethics that you'd like to either ask or share? Okay, I put everybody to sleep. Good deal. Joe, I'm glad you've got a happy smile on your face. I, I do have a question. Oh. Can I? Oh. Yeah. Uh. So have you ever had anyone, because this question was asked of me just last week, um, we have hired a new deputy director and her name is Mickey Easley, yay. We're so excited to have Mickey on board. But Mickey is a licensed social worker. So the question she asked was, so I have, uh, I'm conflicted because of, you know, uh, my ethical code, right? <laughs> and, uh, being a mandated reporter versus now as an unbudsman um, not being a mandated reporter so the question is have you ever had anyone who uh, had a conflict with with that and brought it to the attention and how was that resolved one one way is to go to the their um wherever they got their, wherever their license or membership is, um, explain that they're now an ombudsman and that they, in order to do that job, they can, cannot be a mandated reporter and ask that this licensing place give them a pass <laughs> on not following their stuff. Um, Joe or Heather, do, have you guys, got other ideas yeah well you know i've i've tried to say to people who are social workers or um in a in a professional come from a professional background where they may may have been a mandated reporter that you're not working as a nurse you're not working as um as that kind of pro professional you're working as an ombudsman and because of that um, you can't be a mandated reporter. I, I think um, this this has come up in the past, um, and I know when when um, Becky Kurtz was director of the Office of Long Term Care and Buzzing Programs, we we had this discussion with um, the National Association of Social Workers, and um, they actually had a different opinion. <laughs> they felt they felt that they that they still were mandated reporters. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't think we've, we've resolved it, but at least in my mind, um, if you're not working as a nurse or a social worker or some other mandated reporter, you're working in this program as an ombud and, um, we're not mandated reporters because that's what the federal regulations tell us. I'm sorry. It's Lynn. That makes sense. Thank you, Joe. 
This is Heather, you know, right at the very get go when our ombudsmen are hired, that's the first conversation we have. And I would say in my 20 years with the ombudsman program, we've maybe had two people say, boy, this is not what I expected. I, I just can't um, not look away and not report that. Uh, so, I, I mean, I think it's so critical, you know, when Carol brought up that code of ethics right from the very beginning, um, as Joe said, you wear that hat of the ombudsman. And if people struggle with that, then it's probably not a good fit. And I'm very grateful for, you know, for the probationary process for, for that reason, um, because sometimes it's just not the right fit. But overall, in my 20 years, we've only having only two people that was, you know, we've been pretty fortunate. But um, same with our volunteers, you know, we, we are very, you're wearing the hat of a volunteer ombudsman and not of an attorney or a doctor, um, you know, our physicians, we have highly educated volunteers and our physicians are like, oh, I, I can't turn away. I, I just have to step down and resign because I, this is a struggle for me. Thank you, Heather and Joe. You know, Carolyn, I will, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Um, you know, I'm a social worker, and when I first started working as a local ombudsman, I have to tell you, I struggled. And I think what brought me the peace of mind was when federal law changed. And I had that, that backbone to, um, to be able to uh, justify uh, what I was doing. And I think for me that, I mean, it didn't prevent me from um, not reporting, but it still gave me that peace of mind that, that I had that backing. So I really appreciated that change just because peace of mind is a, an important thing. Mm -hmm. Well, prior to the federal rule, I mean, Joe, and Carol, you can recall all of the dilemmas that we went through. I mean, it was complicated and difficult because some of the states didn't have the ability to make those changes. And when that federal rule came, that really helped all of our states. And it was such, such a benefit and really on the resident's behalf. I mean, being a mandated reporter does not allow us to do our advocacy. So that was really significant and such a victory for the people we serve. Absolutely. And I think it's also important to, to let people know um, it's not like the ombudsman is just going to walk away and, well, you know, I don't care if they, you know, got raped. I don't care if, you know, somebody's beating them up at night. Uh, no, we, even if we can't report it, we're not going to walk away without making sure that somehow the resident is protected if they are in a state where they need, I mean, if in a, in a position where they need to be protected. I mean, we're gonna find somebody else that might know the situation. We're gonna try to talk to the resident about why they should let us report it. I mean, so it's not like, um, you know, oh, can't, oh, can't say anything. So, um, and I will, um, actually I'll do a little bit of uh, research um, and send out to you guys. I, I know we have addressed this, um, but it's been several years ago. So let me see if I can't find some good um, good resources for you guys to look at. I am gonna um, close the recording, but we'll keep, uh, let's see here, what do I wanna do? I want to stop recording.